And now, if you would please, <clears throat> join me as we say together our call to worship. Let us come together, all who seek God's voice today. May God open our eyes and touch our hearts. Let us proclaim God's love for all the world. And let us sing to the Lord, now and forever. Amen. Amen indeed. Now let's sing to the Lord our processional hymn, number 563. from the book of Isaiah. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come and save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where the jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. This is the word of God. Thank you, God.
as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Come, Holy Spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O God. There are some people brought to Jesus, a man who was deaf and could hardly talk and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, he put his fingers in the man's ear, and he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to the heaven, and with a deep sigh he said, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears opened. And his tongue loosened, and he started to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He makes the deaf hear, and the mute speak. This is the gospel of hope. Praise, Praise to you, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit.
try to be a little more energetic at 11. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautifully done. Thank you so much. Will you pray with me, please? Holy and amazing God, we thank you for the opportunity you have given each and every one of us again this morning to rise from our slumber, gather in this holy place, listen for your word, sing songs to your name. And we now ask that you speak to us. Speak to us your word and your will into our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And we ask for this, as in all things, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <clears throat> well, the prophet Isaiah spoke and continues to speak to people who have been hurt, who have been thrown out of their homes and made to live in humiliating circumstances among those who were stronger than they were, those who had power over them. And Isaiah, knowing for whom he speaks, speaks words of comfort, words of hope, and even words of joy. The entirety of Holy Scripture speak to, speaks to us words of comfort hope, and joy. From the very beginning, in the creation stories of Genesis, where even after Adam and Eve made the decision to do the exact opposite of what God has asked them to do, they were not killed, as the threat had been. They were actually given new life, new direction, new hope. And after that, the rest of scriptures just repeats itself over and over again with God coming to the aid of people who either made their own bad and harmful decisions or had been harmed by the decisions and actions of others. Well, we still live in a world where ample opportunity abounds for us to make bad decisions and for us to be harmed by the actions of others. You know, I, was, um, I took one of those online quizzes the other day, you know, where you could answer a bunch of questions and it tells you something about your personality or something. <clears throat> well, this one, it was 100 questions, and it gave you a score that they said how privileged you were in life. Now, granted, these quizzes are often designed more as entertainment than any sort of specific scientific barometer, but I took it. I wanted to see how privileged they, said they would say I was or wasn't. And, and you have to understand the way these questions were worded, privilege was equated with maybe being immune from prejudice or, or hurt in life. Well, I scored 29 out of 100. Hardly a privilege at all, they said. But I did score 29. And the things I, I scored as being privileged with had to deal with the color of my skin, the fact that I'm currently employed and can pay rent and buy food every day, the fact that I'm a man, and that I have received quality education throughout my life. And I've always known that these things, and I've always tried to as humbly as possible recognize and accept that, yes, doors have been open to me in life that have not been open to others. But those same things I am privileged with never prevented me from being hurt. For I have not always had gainful employment. In fact, I've been unemployed several times in my life. After having great careers to come crashing down, I've even been homeless, couch surfing for months, you know, not when I'm a teenager, I mean in my 30s, you know, sleeping on people's couches. And while I have had good education throughout my life, I do not come from a family who could help me pay for it, and I owe an awful lot of money in those high-interest student loans. And while I am a man, I am a gay man. 
who came of age during the 1980s and the AIDS crisis and the moral majority condemnations of my lifestyle. And I have suffered real, verbal, mental, spiritual, and physical abuse at the hands of those who had more power than me. And I know I am in no way unique, especially in this room. But the one thing that could never be shouted out of me or punched out of me was my knowing God and God's power to restore. Amen. (laughs) People hurt other people. God restores people. And God does not restore you by asking you to deny yourselves. On the contrary, when you read God's holy word, it is abundantly clear that restoration is actually achieved by embracing yourselves and by embracing God as your path to wellness. When the prophet Isaiah spoke to the people living in exile, living in fear, he spoke gently to them, saying, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad once more. The desert shall rejoice and blossom They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Our God, who will strengthen the hands of the weak, saying to everyone with a fearful heart, Be strong and do not fear, for here is your God who has come to save you. Here is your God who has come to save you. You see, when people are broken, when you and I are hurt, God does not set out to break us more. God seeks to heal us, to take what is broken and put it back together again. You might not be put back together in the same way as before. In fact, you should probably hope and pray that you're not put back the same way you were before, but rather that you will be something new something greater, someone who is now closer to God than you were before. Past hurts and past wounds are not erased by God. They are transformed by God. (coughs) The Japanese have this long tradition of repairing broken pots and, and vases with gold. It's called kunsingi. And if something breaks, that's valuable, they'll take all the pieces and put them back together again using gold as the solder so that the new pot has the essence of what was before but is now bound in gold. But the thing is, in this tradition, they don't put all the pieces back. They leave one or two missing so that the new vase, this gold, golden-covered masterpiece, isn't perfect, but beautifully imperfect. When Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples, the first thing he told them was, don't be afraid. The second thing he told them, look at my scars. This beautiful risen Christ retained his scars. The wounds had healed and they did not hurt him anymore, but the scars remained, not as an ugly reminder of the past, but as the golden glue that now held his new way of being together. In one of his most profound works, I think, a book titled Life of the Beloved, the spiritual writer Henry Nouwen reflects on how we, were, we are all made in the image of the beloved of God, that is Jesus Christ, and how in that image we are to live as the beloveds of God. And that life, just like the life of Jesus, is made manifest when we understand and embrace our lives as being chosen, blessed, broken, and given. Chosen, blessed, broken, and given. One of the greatest joys I have ever experienced in my life is when I finally realized and believed 
that I am chosen by God. That long before any human eyes laid themselves upon me, I was already seen in God's loving eyes. And one of the greatest feelings I've ever had in my life is when I came to know in a very real way the blessings that had been given to me. Not privileges, like that quiz pointed out, but blessings. Things given to me not because of anything this world has to offer, but given to me simply because I am the beloved of God. And that good feeling is amplified beyond measure every time I remember that I too, me, can be a blessing in someone else's life. For the blessings that we give to each other are simply expressions of the blessing that has rested upon us from eternity. It is the deepest affirmation of our true self to know that we are all blessed by God and that we were all created to be a blessing from God to others. But even as great as those two things are, it's not enough only to be chosen and blessed. We also need to understand, come to terms with, and embrace the world we live in that produces broken people. And that our brokenness is part of who we are, not to be shunned, but embraced. Meaning, we don't have to hide from what has hurt us. We can bring it out into the light. You know, I've never met a perfect person in my life. Meaning, I have never met anyone who has not been hurt, whether self-inflicted or inflicted by others. And our brokenness, our hurt, is as unique as any other expression of our individuality and is integral to our wholeness. Think about that. Our brokenness is integral to our wholeness. Henry Nouwen writes that the deep truth, truth that sets us free is that our human suffering need not be an obstacle to the joy and peace we so desire, but can instead become the means to it. The great secret of the spiritual life is that everything we live, be it gladness or sadness, joy or pain, health or illness, can all be part of the journey toward God. So when we embrace our chosenness and our blessedness and our brokenness, then we're ready, just like Christ, to be given. For our greatest fulfillment in life comes in giving ourselves to others. So just as the body of Christ each week is taken and blessed and broken and given, so too can we become that bread for the world, feeding hungry mouths, feeding hungry souls. The world is starving for the message of God's love shown to us through Jesus Christ. And the world knows well the feeling of hunger. But for many, they do not know where to go for food. I mean, look at what is happening right now in the Middle East and Europe. People are being forced to flee their homes and live in exile because the atrocities of war have come to their doorstep. Talk about hurt. They didn't start these wars. It wasn't their political ambitions for world power that now have babies drowning in the sea. And yet, the people to whom they have turned to help, for help, most of whom are Christian, by the way, all of those European governments are led by Christians. Are they helping? Some, and now they're being forced to help a little more, that world opinions kind of turned against them. But some others are herding them into camps with numbers on their arms, identifying them as foreigners, people not wanted in their country, people who are being made to feel less than human. Does any of this sound familiar? I mean, can the world actually have such collective amnesia over this? I mean, what about what's happening in our own country? 
black lives, white lives, all lives, are we simply becoming immune to the real danger our collective national narrative does to people? And how about here at home? Every month, if not more often, we hear about another gay, lesbian, or trans youth being kicked out of their parents' home because of how they are yearning to express themselves as God made them. Yes, the world knows well the pain of hunger. To where shall they turn for food? Well, St. Jude's, how about here? I mean, we are a people who have known hunger and hurt, and you may still be in that place today, and if you are, please keep coming back. Because we can show you what it means to be transformed to be loved out of your hurt and to be loved into our hearts. I get asked all the time, why isn't this church filled to capacity? We have a great message. I mean, we're, we are not only a people who know the pain of hunger, we are also a people who know what it means to be the chosen, blessed, broken, and given. So I'm going to ask you, why isn't this church filled to capacity? I mean, we should all ask ourselves some serious questions this morning. For instance, here's one. Have you or are you ready to accept your place as a chosen child of God? Yes. I hope so. Do you accept and take God's blessings into your lives? I do. Can you see that it is your unique brokenness that brings you closer to Christ? Well, if you can say yes to those, if you can even just believe that those are just a little bit possible for you, then I'm going to ask you, are you ready to give of yourselves? You know, we are not going to feed a hungry world or, or help a hurting soul by pushing our collective responsibility off onto some, say, outreach program, or by thinking it's only the job of the pastor. We are going to feed a hungry world and help those hurting souls by actively living out our blessings, by giving ourselves to others, each and every one of us. When a hurting blind and mute person was presented to Jesus. He didn't shove him off to someone else. He took him in his arms, touched his broken body, and made him whole again, shiny and new, only this time held together with the spit and spittle of Christ. How about that? Because Jesus performs miracles with broken things, whether it be broken bread or broken lives. Our job is not to save people. We can't do that. Our job is to be living witnesses to how we have been saved. And it should be the life duty of everyone here who has ever experienced grace and love in your lives to make sure that all those who still cry in the night can be shown the path into the light of God's love to say to all those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for here is your God. Amen. God calls us to give of ourselves. Restores us, calls us, go out and give. It's time we really believe just how beloved we are and to turn ourselves into the blessings this world, this community, and this church still needs. And my advice to you is simple and clear. Be strong and do not fear, for here is your God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? confident that God hears us and knows our needs, let us pray. 
gracious healer. You visit us when we are in pain and worry. You spread your hands upon our wounds. You speak to demons. You bring peace and freedom to all who seek you. Liberate the captive. Give courage and perseverance to those who are weary of the struggles for justice so that new life and strength will infuse their tired bones. Saving God, we see the desperation of our sisters and brothers as well as ourselves. And knowing your love for what you have made, we beg your promises to be fulfilled. That waters will spring in the desert, that healing can come even in the time of death, that protection is available from whatever is frightening and salvation is there for those who have been told they are beyond help. Into your hands we place ourselves, constantly offering you praise in the name of the one whose life, death, resurrection, and ascension is the very definition of our own lives, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated, everyone. And join me, please, as we say together our prayer of revelation and illumination. Holy God, we admit that it is sometimes hard to understand all that you are. In fact, we cannot understand all that you are. We 
ask for wisdom in knowing your truth, your truth of love, your truth of mercy. And with that prayer on our lips, hear now the prayers of our hearts. together our very need for God's truth in our lives. Lord, Lord help us Lord, to accept the call into your ministry of helping and caring for others. Forgive our reluctance, our doubts, and disbelief. Help us to know what an honor it is to be called to serve in your holy name. Well, my friends, how much does God love us? Enough to send the divine heart, hope, and spirit to us not to condemn, but to save and to guide. And so through the lives we live, let us continually show our thanks to God. Amen. 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 And may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right to give God thanks and praise, so let us join with that heavenly choir of angels in that unending hymn of praise, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, power and my might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Well, blessed is the one who came down to earth, so that we may all know the wonder of God's love. So with thanks and praise, let us once again proclaim what is the mysterious and miraculous truth of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ is here, and Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. And now let us all say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was given up Betrayed by one of his own friends, he was sharing a meal with his disciples, and during that meal he took what was an ordinary piece of bread until he raised it, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to each and every person there, telling them to take and eat, for this now is my body, soon to be broken for you. Later, during that same supper, Jesus took an ordinary cup of wine until he raised it and blessed it, and then passed it to all of those there with him and told them once again to take and drink from this cup. For he said, this now is the cup of the new covenant, soon to be sealed in the shedding of my blood for you and for all people across all time. <coughs> and then he told them that every time that you do this, Every time that you share in this meal, remember me. <clears throat> Holy God, we do remember. And we humbly ask now that you turn these simple elements of your creation, bread and grape, into our spiritual nourishment once more, filling us with knowledge of your grace and mercy that will allow us to go out into this world and share it with those still hungry for that love. We ask for this as in all things in that holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My friends, this is an open communion table. And we, sit, we have an open communion table at this church as in every metropolitan church, community church around the world, simply because we know there is no membership requirements that stands in the way of these gifts now blessed by God being offered to all of you. We simply ask that you come and receive these gifts and come just as you are.
my friends, as you leave this place today, go out into the world with the peace of Christ in your heart, and remember, everyone you meet is a beloved child of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.